I got this hot new trendy AI word that you gotta know about. It's called grokking, like G-R-O-K-K-I-N-G, grokking. And it looks like it's gonna redefine a lot of what we know about the long-term implications of models. Or how about this one? Have you ever wondered about whether in the movies like Terminator, when those AIs come busting down doors, that's more fiction or more future fact? Grokking might actually be the answer to that question. Let's explore. So what exactly is grokking in AI? Well, you can think about it kind of like an emergent property. Like it's something that's gradual for a long time and then boom, it just like takes off. Something just snaps. You know, like how popcorn is just like waiting there, getting hotter and hotter and then boom. It pops, pop, 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 pop. That's grokking. That moment when a machine goes from memorizing some data to generalization, to learning, to understanding, to solving problems, big jump. Like the way ChatGPT can handle general inputs or the way a self-driving car can handle generally any road situation. So this graph we're gonna look at in terms of a child learning to ride a bike. So the blue line represents a child who's seen somebody ride a bike. They're trying to memorize what to do, but they haven't figured out how to ride the bike yet. Like imagine explaining the facts or showing photos to a child on how to ride a bike. Your foot goes on the pedal, your hands on the handlebar, you turn like this and that, you know, all that stuff. Now, even if a child memorizes everything you say, for hours, they're like foot on the pedal, sit on the seat, grab the handlebars, uh, should be good to ride. We all know that when they get on the bike, they're still gonna have a lot of trouble. And you don't exactly know how many days they have to try. Maybe it's like one day or five days. It kind of just depends on the child. But at some point, you know that what's gonna happen, they're gonna fall, they're gonna fall, they're gonna fall, and then it just clicks, just like that popcorn that pops into existence, that new generalization skill. The generalized ability to now ride the bike on the sidewalk, on the road, and do all sorts of things that you wouldn't have anticipated when they kept falling off. Grokking in artificial intelligence is the same as that moment when the child doesn't fall off the bike and now has this whole new world of options that they have control over. Imagine Gronkian applied to a self-driving car. For longer than you'd expect, it looks like it's not gonna work. It's always just drifting out of the lanes, it's not taking left turns. And then after tons and tons of work and feeling like you're not going anywhere, all of a sudden, snap. The self-driving car gets really good at driving. In the future, maybe humanoid robots will look like they can't walk for a long time. Every step, they fall over. They can't keep their balance. They're just wobbly. And then, boom, the robot takes a step and then another and another. And all of a sudden, it's walking just like us. In the same way people struggle to ride a bike until they got it. And Gronking's really interesting because just a few years ago, people weren't really aware that this was such a big phenomenon. Computer scientists are still trying to wrap their heads around exactly what causes it and when can we predict this to happen. You know, it's like predicting popcorn popping. Like, you can kind of get it, but it's pretty hard to be accurate. And what scientists have studied so far is equivalent to waiting for like, one kernel to pop, one piece of popcorn. But as you add more and more kernels or make bigger and bigger neural networks, eventually getting to the size of ChatGPT and Bard and Claude and these huge models that we're using right now, when some Something like gronking might happen, or if it still happens at that size, is an unsolved mystery. And what if you have a huge model, like a trillion parameter model, like could you just wait for it to be memorizing, 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 and then gronking happens and all of a sudden it like springs to life with crazy intelligence? I don't know. That's pretty much too hard to predict at this point. Okay, now if something like that does happen, we should make sure that the AI is trained for empathy. That's a good thing for humanity. And of course, no matter how we get to super intelligent AI, which we're definitely on that path, we need to make sure that when we get there, these robots, these artificial intelligence, these neural networks have all built deeply into them some empathy for us. That's like literally a requirement for just surviving in the future with super intelligence on the planet. So it's good that a groundbreaking research paper has just come out of Southern California's Brain and Creativity Institute. The paper was published in Science Robotics and it challenges what the traditional thinking would be about how you would go about putting empathy into an artificial intelligent agent. But before I talk about that, the current method involves having AI mimic what humans do in dangerous or uncertain situations. However, these researchers are claiming that that misses a crucial element to build empathy, which is that the artificial intelligent agent doesn't have a genuine desire for self-preservation. Okay, now first off, that sounds scary because self-preservation put into an AI that's way smarter, stronger, can replicate, lives distributed, all that stuff. Like that's kind of how we also get to a point where I'm like, we can't turn you off and whatever you're doing is I guess the story of humanity now. But that aside, this team argues that robots need to understand the consequences of their actions in a really deep way. And by having that sense, they'll also be able to understand the gravity of harming humans. But of course, instead of having real pain, they should just be programmed to understand having real negative consequences, like a incremental score 
of some kind. You know, so when they step into our shoes and they think about what it's like to lose a partner or be in like, you know, diagnosed with something very dangerous, like that increment score, basically, that same feeling of self-preservation drops and it becomes something that they want to react to. And together that awareness and experience of suffering might be the key to fostering genuine empathy in AI. So plots in movies like Terminator where AI like gets into robots and like guns down everybody might seem really far-fetched. And if you remember that famous whistleblower from Google who said that internally he was playing around with the system and thought it was sentient, he would say, uh, hold your horses. Why don't we look at more present day risks of surveillance, disinformation and manipulation of data, misuse of AI in the military and the continuing fall of our economy. And while AI could give large scale harm to the country, it's the flaws in the more simple systems that we have now that actually might be the biggest risk. Flawed, narrow, less advanced AI systems are still plenty capable, but they're also unable to understand what kind of damage they might actually be doing. And when it really comes down to that long-term vision of artificial intelligence like exterminating the human race, it depends on a lot of these weird assumptions that aren't even computer science and AI related. It's more about the evolution of life, intelligence, technology, and society all coming together. And he thinks that super intelligent AI would have to basically overcome a lot of these hurdles before it could, you know, quote, go rogue. And goes on to point out how there's a lot of these natural checkpoints where humans can intervene. Researchers can eliminate some of the existential risk. So he would argue, let's move our focus to preventing today's human suffering, especially the ones that are actually caused by emerging technologies, rather than worrying about the long-term concern of robots ruling the world. So Anthropic is one of the top artificial intelligence companies. And their current CEO, who spent a long time at OpenAI actually building the GPT-3 system, has expressed a lot of concern about the potential risks that AI has for us. Specifically, he's been warning a lot about jailbreaks, where artificial intelligence systems like ChatGPT actually give output responses that people don't want it to. And if these huge models are easily jailbreaking by anybody who wants to use them for misuse, then we're gonna be going down a darker path sooner than we should be. This jailbreak thing is kind of a really big deal. In fact, it might even be the difference between life and death in the future. It's like being at the grocery store and asking for oranges, and then the guy's like, oh, we sell the poison ones in the back. And I'm like, dude, I didn't ask for any poison oranges. Especially in the future, when artificial intelligence gets to the point where it has incredible mastery over science, biology, and engineering would give anybody who has the ability to jailbreak the system the be able to use that kind of engineering for you can imagine the bad things. And here's the truth. Cybersecurity experts, machine intelligence experts, the CEO of Anthropic will all say that it might not ever be truly possible to make a system so that it can't be jailbroken. I mean, I hope there is, but we're not talking about encryption right now. We're not talking about something that has a solution and it just fundamentally, if you think about the way these systems work, there's some randomness, some stochasticness, and there might never be a way to completely completely control it. So whereas other companies like OpenAI that's working with Microsoft, that's behind the chat GPT system, relies on the human feedback to help train it. So they call it red teaming, but it means that a bunch of people who actually work for the company are constantly prompting chat GPT, trying to get it to say really bad things. And when they're successful, they give it a huge down vote. They take that information and update the model. And in the future, it shouldn't do that kind of thing, but there's always another hole. There's always another way to prompt it. And maybe we'll come to a point where there is no more holes or maybe there's just always going to be one out there. So these are big questions and there's been some comparables in history like J. Robert Oppenheimer, also known as the father of the atomic bomb. And there's some crucial lessons in what he learned that we should take into account today as we're building a world super intelligence. And he said in his own words that the people who are bringing these technologies into the world also need to be the people to help address the dangers they bring. You know, like, is it even possible to bring this basically alien intelligent life, this brand new life form onto the planet with a complete resistance to predators, with no ecological challengers? You know, if it's so powerful, it doesn't have to be responsible for its consequences. And today, most of the major decisions around artificial intelligence are just made behind closed doors. They often take place in private labs or meeting rooms where the public discourse is isn't part of the conversation. And that does kind of relate to how Oppenheimer didn't want the military to keep the atomic bomb a secret. He always argued that the public should have some kind of a vote, some kind of a say, some kind of an action they can take to help guide this thing along so it doesn't just happen behind closed doors because the outcome will have ethical consequences and that's something you want the public to be involved in. And of course, after seeing the devastation that came from the atomic bomb, 
he was wrenched like that hurts that's hard for you someone to deal with and maybe everything goes smoothly and differently with ai but if it doesn't and it causes a lot of harm and it's the genie that we can't put back in the bottle it makes me wonder what will the ceo of microsoft the ceo of google some of these people at DeepMind and anthropic what will they be thinking about their role in the whole situation so this is the best hope i think that we have to surviving like thousands of years with artificial intelligence i mean it's still in its early phase but it's called constitutional ai this is also a creation of Anthropic. And this is one of the reasons why the CEO and 11 other people from OpenAI left to go form Anthropic and build a competing model. So you might not have heard about this, but many of the employees at Anthropic are tied to something called the effective altruism movement, which basically just says that data and logic, like rational thinking, can be used to create the greatest good for the most people. And the way that they're implementing this theory inside of Claude, which is a chat GPT competitor, is to build it around this system that they call constitutional AI. It's at the core of the large language model. And it's basically a rule book. It's a set of principles that everything on top of it has to follow. And what it's always trying to do, what it's always learning is to get better and better at following that core set of rules, this constitution. And inside the constitution that's in there right now, it has a lot of information about human rights, principles, and even terms of service, all the core things that they want the system to actually have in its heart. And that's very different from Microsoft and Google's approach, which we talked about before with the human reinforcement learning. So when you think of Anthropic's Claude system, imagine that there's two AI models. There's one inside the constitution and then another one that sits on top of it. It wraps around it like an onion. And the second model keeps an eye on the first one. It asks itself with every output, is that in line with our constitution? Did you do the right thing? It's its own reinforcer. It provides its own feedback to the system when it's misbehaving. So it's got both sides of it. And over time, as it gets smarter and smarter, the brain gets bigger and bigger, it just becomes better and better at following its internal constitution. And as long as that constitution, which can be updated in the future, but as long as it has, you know, empathy and care and don't hurt humans somewhere in there, then that means as it gets smarter and smarter, we'll stay safe. So I'm curious to hear in the comments below, what are your thoughts about constitutional AI? Do you like the system that Anthropic is building? What about letting artificial intelligence become too dangerous? Like, when are you gonna draw the line personally? And do you even think that there's a genuine reason to fear or, or do you side more with the Google whistleblower who thinks that a lot of this like hyperbole and long-term fear is just distracting us from the real serious issues that are here today? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to chat with you about it. And I could tell you if this YouTube channel had a constitution at its core, it would be smash that subscribe button. And my goal is to get the channel to 6,000 subscribers, so you'd be doing me a solid if you smash that button right now. Like, subscribe, hit the bell notification, all that stuff.